Good afternoon, Adrian Maldonado. Hello, Mark. Nice to see you. You too. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Yeah, no, it's great to be on here. Yeah, uh, well, 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 in that sense, welcome to Meet the Archaeologist. And, uh, and actually, uh, I suppose, first of all, as ever, uh, could you possibly just introduce yourself and your role in your institution where you're currently set? Well, uh, I'm currently a uh, research associate for the Glasgow Iona Research Group. We're a group of people across the College of Arts here at the University of Glasgow. Uh -huh. Archaeologists, historians, Celticists, people who study literature, uh, who have an interest on the monastery and the island of Iona. Okay. Uh, I'm coming at it from a sort of early Christian archaeologist point of view, and that's my that's my sort of background and my area of expertise, if you like. Uh -huh. uh, it's early Christian burial is where my PhD started off from, but in recent years, I've been doing a lot more work on the archaeology of early monasticism in in the British Isles, and particularly uh, my research is in early medieval Scotland. Okay, cool, cool. I have to say that's that's really that's a really a, a really good idea actually bringing together all these different research research interests. Uh, to focus on on this stuff and well yeah we'll, no we we just realized independently we we're all doing all this this work uh, and actually we should all be speaking to each other and sort of seeing if we can't put together a, a sort of research agenda that's a little bit more coherent than each of our own individual work so it's going well so far we're we're, we're hoping to sort of make it into something a lot bigger Wonderful. soon outside of Glasgow Uni but that's that's another conversation okay cool cool maybe for another day um okay well and then in that sense then and what got you into uh into I suppose Christian burials from in Scotland I mean it's a it, you, you were just saying just before off camera that you that you're, you're from um uh, Puerto Rico so I mean what's the um what what, what got you into that that's a very niche thing isn't it <laughs> it's very niche. I mean, there's a lot of archaeology, which is very niche, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I think, uh, no, the, I mean, the, the, the story that I generally tell people is that I was I was damaged, you know. Growing up in Puerto Rico, I had an older brother who introduced me to J.R.R. Tolkien, you know, and oh, right. I read I read The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings at, at too young of an age, mm -hmm, I think, mm -hmm. and it's uh, it really sort of broke me. And uh, and we have a we have a channel uh, in American television called Comedy Central, which was fairly new uh, when I was at the right age, mm -hmm. and they would show uh, old episodes of Monty Python, and of course. Holy Grail came onto my consciousness, and, and these were the these were the formative, uh, you know, events in my youth. Okay. You know? yeah. And I knew all the Indiana Jones films, of course. You know, mm -hmm. Last Crusade was my Indiana Jones. That one was the one that came out when I remembered it coming out. The yeah, other yeah. ones I yeah. saw on VHS, <laughs> you know. But actually, those things weren't uh, they weren't as formative as. You know, just reading about this sort of medieval fantasy world, and and I became sort of an Anglophile uh, off of, off of that. Although, yeah. you went, although obviously you ended up in Scotland, we should. I ended that. up in Scotland. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, well uh, I, I wanted to. Uh, uh, when I was doing my undergraduate, I was doing medieval history. Mm -hmm. uh, this was at Harvard University, and I took the opportunity to come to to the UK for a semester in my junior year. And they had a they, they had a, a good program which had a spot open at St Andrews University, mm -hmm. and I thought medieval institution, medieval castle right in town, mm -hmm. and Abbey ruined uh, ruined Abbey right there in town, a uh, cathedral rather, and uh, just an amazing place all around. You know, you're walking on the streets which go back to the Middle Ages themselves. Mm -hmm. The layout of the streets there at St Andrews, beautiful place, and that kind of blew my mind. Okay. Uh, and in that semester, I traveled all around as much as I could to see as many medieval castles and ruins. And it just, you know, uh, I, I realized I wasn't so much interested in the castles as much as I was in these churches and abbeys. That in, in Scotland, you have these spectacular ruins in the Scottish borders, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, for various historical reasons. A lot of the best medieval churches are completely in ruins. And, and that, really got, that really got to me somehow. And I, at that point, I realized I was into actually i don't know uh, I, I was i was m happier to sort of be there yeah. and be able to touch the remains rather than read about them in books and i, I wanted to do archaeology since then so i finished my degree and i came straight back there's a medieval archaeology program at the university of glasgow they specialized in early medieval archaeology and that set me off on the road to early christian burials 
you know. So I just I started off with sort of medieval castles and then got earlier and earlier and earlier until I ended up with the sort of the Picts and the late Iron Age. That's fascinating. That's really, really cool. And it, it's cool because, I mean, as you say, so often people get this sort of Indiana Jones sense of archaeology. But yeah. also, I suppose, then the next step, I think often, when they, if, they, if they still want to go for that exoticism, is they'll seek out something like Sri Lanka or yeah. you know, they'll end up still trekking through a jungle or in a desert or something if they really want to but it's, it's really yeah it's nice to in some ways it sometimes make i sometimes feel very guilty when i, I realize that like you know i spent six six or seven years living in york you know medieval city with roman streets with you know and and i never took it for granted you know i learned the city inside out i always you know, learned the name the street names and what they were for and and the, the old layouts but I sometimes I, th I think that it's it's it must be so cool to be able to actually come to a place uh, that doesn't have that and just be yeah yeah it, it, it's it's so nice to see the smile on your face talking about it. it's really cool um okay so you you mentioned picts and the iron age now this is this is actually uh just just <laughs> just, just, just to be picky here or picty yeah um uh this is this is actually one of the reasons why i got in touch with you is because uh, in a recent video we were examining uh some archaeology that's coming out of lindisfarne at the moment and one of the comments on the video, someone was asking, well, you know, can you sort of explore a little bit or find someone who can talk a little bit about, for example, Pictish carvings? Not that there are any Pictish carvings on the island. There's a, potentially a Scottish connection, though. But uh, but what, can you just sort of talk us through that? What actually makes Pictish art identifiable? Because in some respects, it's, it's fascinating um, from what I know of the Picts uh, and their art and also that they're sort of later uh, later early medieval history it all gets a bit blurry i think well but from what i'm aware anyway well, how do you how do you pick it up pick it apart how do you, <laughs> hey. How, how do you hey how do you take it apart and how how, how actually do you, do you identify this stuff that's that's really interesting way of sort of phrasing the question you know if we're actually just approaching the art of the picts i mean the you know the the main thing that identifies pictish art is their unique symbols mm. and these symbols are one of the things that drew me to the picts and drew a lot of people to the picts mm -hmm. uh in general they have these symbols this, this really sort of closed a limited set of symbols that they uh engrave onto stones, okay. uh, very often onto standing stones. And in Aberdeenshire, you get a lot of stone circles and, and, and recumbent stone monuments that are reused with, uh, with Pictish symbols carved onto them. It's mm. really, really interesting. Uh, so at some point from about the fifth century, as far as we can sort of date these things, fifth and sixth century onwards, uh, people in that part of the country in the Northeast begin to look around and begin to sort of mark their identity somehow uh, on the landscape around them, mm -hmm. sometimes putting up new stones and sometimes marking stones that have been there for, you know, for eons uh, at, at this point. You know, uh, uh, what's interesting is that they have this set of symbols that is used across the northeast of Scotland, and this is from well, the the the, the southernmost accepted Pictish symbol is from Edinburgh, from mm -hmm. Prince's Street Gardens, but that one was found used as a footbridge, and it's really not known what that's doing there, to be honest. Uh, uh, in any case, it, it's from the fourth uh, north. Sorry, just, just to clarify, in so much as the, yeah. sto the stone might have been brought in for f to be used for masonry kind of thing or whatever. Uh, who knows? It's right. a funny one. It, it would be a strange thing to find there in reuse if it hadn't been there before. You'd think if someone brought it there, they'd want to sort of show it off yeah, uh, yeah. and not just use it as a footbridge. So it's possible that it was actually a Pictish stone in Edinburgh, but it would be a a real outlier. Okay, okay. In any case, besides that yeah. one, the distribution of them is from the fourth and parts north, as far out as the as the Hebrides. Right. You know, and, and 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 in all of this landscape, uh, and and Scotland's a it's a vast place. Uh, it's it's uh, it, it's really striking that uh, they're using the same pretty much the same sort of set of symbols mm. throughout the country. So in a way, there's a sort of decided upon more or less mm. set of symbolism and and, uh, a, a, and people have argued that it's because the symbols are not just sort of heraldry or totems but they're actually the elements of a language that we haven't deciphered yet so the symbols might stand for a sound rather than a letter okay. uh, and it's been argued that when you put symbols together they make up a word let's say a name 
Okay. That's the sort of going theory, and that's why there's a there's a closed set of these things. It's probably an alphabet that we haven't deciphered yet. Yeah, so sort of almost. It sounds as though it's somewhere between uh, this idea is somewhere between hieroglyphs and some sort of Aboriginal landmarkers. It's uh, that's a fascinating yeah. midway. Okay, interesting. So um. So you sort of mentioned there, well, by the sounds of it at least, you mentioned this idea of perhaps they were sort of appropriating monuments maybe from the Neolithic or Bronze Age and this kind of thing. Um, do, do, do you have a sense of there being a coherent sort of artistic style as opposed to just sort of an icono iconographic lexicon almost? Is there actually a, you know, are there sort of some some um, diagnostic elements to Pictish art which, which differentiate it maybe from Iron Age or Viking or, or other stuff? Yeah, no, I mean that that's really interesting. So once you get once you get past the very simple, the earliest stones, which are these simple symbol incised stones, mm. which usually only have two, maybe three symbols on them. Uh, once you get past that stage, around the let's say seventh century or so, dating these things is difficult. Uh, you begin to get the symbols used on uh, stones with the Christian cross on them uh, and other symbolism. And once you get to those. You have this really, uh, uh, this really sort of coherent Pictish art style that includes, actually, a lot of uh, a lot of sort of styles and patterns from Iron Age art, from uh, right. Latin Latin style art. Mm -hmm. There's lots of sort of holdovers uh, in uh, or, or continuities into what becomes Pictish art. At the same time, they're taking lots of influences in from the church, so mm -hmm. all the Christian symbolism and the Old Testament imagery that is being added onto these sort of symbol stones. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, 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 but they're also really sort of virtuoso examples of how to use interlace. Mm. And there's it, it, it's no joke, there's a PhD student in the Celtic and Gallic department here who's doing an entire PhD just on interlace patterns on Pictish stones and other media because the, some of them can be so intricate uh, and, and to carve a sort of really thin strand of interlace and a really complicated pattern on stone is no mean feat. No, no, no. I uh, mean, sometimes, sometimes I try drawing that stuff, yeah. and all you need to go is draw over it when you should have drawn under, and you're like, ah, oh! <laughs> yeah, the whole thing's ruined. The whole ruined. Thing's ruined. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So on stone, that's incredible. And yeah, and so, so and, and 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 so uh, it's some of the patterns that you see on these class two stones are as intricate or more intricate than the ones that you've seen uh, on manuscripts that are that are around the same time. Things like the Book of Kells. Mm -hmm, some mm -hmm. of those patterns are incredibly intricate and complicated. And there's some stones like the ones at Aberlemno in the churchyard, which have it, 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 this really intensely complicated pattern of interlace yeah. that you would only find done in a sort of with a quill on vellum. So, so does that mean then? Uh, and so, so I'm reminded, for example, when it comes to say books like Lindisfarne Gospels and and, and the Book of Kells, yeah. even often that that it seems that the priests are inspired perhaps by, especially in the Lindisfarne Gospels, Saxon metalwork. Is it possible? I mean, who's inspiring who? Is it is it yeah. the book inspiring the Pictish carver, or yes. is it the carver yes. inspiring the bookmaker? I mean, what's going on? This is this is the perennial question, isn't it? I mean, right. there's this whole this whole uh, debate about insular art, which is the term yeah. now insular art for essentially early Christian art of the sort of seventh, eighth, ninth centuries until the Viking Age. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's you know a lot of it is is to do with interlaced patterns and and and, and this kind of this kind of thing. Uh, as you mentioned, the Lindisfarne Gospels, the Book of Kells, mm -hmm. all of these early illuminated manuscripts are really good examples Book of, of insular art. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Mm. Um, and these Pictish stones, uh, uh, the ones with symbols and interlace and the cross, also fall under that sort of insular art category. Uh, but they're they're very much identified as Pictish examples uh, of that. They're all participating in the same. Kind of milieu. Now they're calling it insular art now for the last 10, 20 years because it used to be called things like Hiberno Saxon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now what's interesting about that term is that, you know, it's a hyphenated term, mm -hmm. but it, it just includes Hiberno meaning Ireland and Saxon meaning English essentially. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it leaves out that sort of the, the Scottish 
uh, input altogether. Mm. And now we're recognizing that there are these major early monasteries at places like Park Mahomic mm -hmm. uh, that Martin Carver excavated for 10 years. Uh, only just recently, uh, uh, the monograph, the, the final monograph has come out for that. These early and really influential monasteries are also involved in creating the vellum for these manuscripts, mm. and they're certainly scriptoria of their own. That means that some of these manuscripts that we have could have been uh, could have been worked on by Pictish uh, monks, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Pictish artists as mm -hmm. well, and so that adds another. Uh, another little tangle to that web. Mm. Uh, it means that, yes, there's another node. It used to be thought that the Picts were always on the receiving end of mm. influences from Iona mm -hmm. in the west mm -hmm. and Northumbria uh, mm. from the south. Uh, but now it's more likely that the Pictish monasteries are just part of this wider communication. So there's these Iona and Lindisfarnes of the world which are clearly at the forefront of mm. what now is becoming insular art and Christianity at that point. Mm. There's these major Pictish monasteries that are also uh, having this influence on all of this movement. They're an active participant in this. And we're only just starting to find this out. Uh, there's only been one investigation on a large scale of a Pictish monastery, and that's Martin Carver's work at Port Mahomet. So right. we just need more of it, to be yeah, honest. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, that, see, that, now that, that is really... That is really interesting, and 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 this is where I think. Um, so, <laughs> sorry, it sounds as though I was like this is going to be a boring interview. No, 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 no. I mean, <laughs> no, what I mean by that is it's really interesting because it uh, it paints a picture. No, well, pun intended, I guess. Um, which which really highlights that actually uh, that that the, the I suppose the popular notion of um, the the Picts and also especially for example the the remnants of of for example, the art and culture, is actually something which was very isolationist. Whereas mm -hmm. actually what you're describing there is something which was which became very integrated and may even have yeah. actually inspired other art styles. That's 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 a fascinating yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, by the, yeah, exactly. So by the time they kind of emerge onto the wider uh, consciousness, it's really mm -hmm. with the the venerable Bede, yeah, yeah. and he's writing about you know his history of the English Church. Yeah. I mean, that's his, that's his remit, you and know, he, the ecclesiastical he, 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 history. Yes, uh, sorry, ecclesiastical history of the English people. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah exactly. And, and yeah. you know, so that that's his that's his sort of remit. But he's also including all this incidental information about what's going on in the wider world. And he does talk about the Picts and. And, and when he does talk about them, he's talking about their churches, you know, yeah. their monasteries. Mm. Uh, but, but you know, but he's not overly involved in sort of telling their history or their past. So we get a sense of them as peripheral peoples, which which goes back to the the way the Romans, uh, de, you know, uh, depicted them in all of their mm -hmm. works. All the sort of late classical sources are all about the Picts as these existential threats on the on on the beyond mm. the frontiers you know so it, it 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 kind of perpetuates that that and yet, story and, yet, and that's still what you get in movies isn't it yeah yeah and yet well and yet an existential threat who you readily trade with for hundreds of years it, 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 yeah. <laughs> so yeah so exactly. that says yeah i think that and, and i think what, what's interesting is that there is it's, there's an awful lot of um Propaganda is probably too harsh a word, but there's an awful lot of stereotyping surrounding, especially I think these more isolated groups in northern northern Britain, definitely. Um, yeah. But uh, that's that is very very interesting. And um, I, I, I think I, I, you know I think to a certain extent, uh, you know, if, if the Picts had had their own sort of venerable beat, uh -huh. uh, as it were, telling their own story, uh, we would be telling the story a little bit differently. You know, they're all in conversation with each other. Mm. All the monks of Jarrow and Lindisfarne uh, and all these places are all you know in this Christian network. They're mm. you know they're not really fighting amongst themselves. No. They're getting together in these church councils and they're deciding what's in and what's out. And that could get a little bit tense, but at the, at the end of the day, they're fighting the bigger enemy, which is darkness, ignorance, paganism. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, At this time, this is really what their mission is. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 you know, but even though they're still all together, they still have room and there's still this very pressing need to stress their local mm. identities. And therefore, you get Northumbrian uh, art and history and culture and you also get Pictish art and history and culture. Mm. These things can exist 
together, you know. And then I suppose more broadly, for for again, I suppose political reasons, you then eventually yeah. get you get so sort of a sense of Irish and and British insular identity as opposed to say Roman ways of doing books and and yeah. even North African ways of doing of doing uh, uh, how to write a Bible and this kind of thing. So yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, so maybe yeah, it's just it's just a matter of how close you get as to how detailed the picture is. But um, oh, once again, picture it's just it's there everywhere. You, you must have a room you full can't, of poems. You can't help yourself. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's a disease. I'm sorry. Um, okay, cool. Well, thank you so much for that. Thank you, and and uh, uh, hopefully we've answered some because like I say, this person is particularly interested in 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 these carvings. Hopefully we've answered some of that for uh, for that person as well um, but now if, if, if it's okay can we just move on to some of the questions that I ask more generally of, of archaeologists yeah. um, so, uh, so I suppose first of all um, what for you Adrian is the most satisfying thing about being an archaeologist I think it's the ability uh, or, or at least the potential to tell a story that hasn't been told mm. in a very long time or, or, or maybe ever mm -hmm. you know I think that's that's one of the things that gets you out of bed in the morning you know, is, is, is the fact that whether, and this is whether you're going out on a dig or not, you know, maybe it's just a sort of uh, the kind of research that you do. If you look at something in a new way, you can perhaps read it in a new way without even going out on a dig. Mm -hmm. The potential, though, for telling those kinds of untold stories, I think that's really what, what draws me in and what keeps me in and keeps me going. Oh, yeah. Okay. Cool. I like that storyteller, archaeologist as storytellers. I like it. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, well, as a storytelling archaeologist, then, yeah. What do you think are the challenges on the horizon for archaeology? What 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 what's coming along uh, in the near future? Well, I think uh, there's there's a couple of things without getting too political about it. I mean, uh, because of the way things are going currently uh, in the UK, there's going to be a lot of uncertainty, and with uncertainty comes uh, restrictions on funding and the mm -hmm. kinds of grants that you might be able to apply for within the EU and without uh, or out with the EU, or you know, with the way things are going in Scotland, maybe within outside the UK. The UK. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it just means it just means uncertainty, regardless mm -hmm. of which way things go. I mean, that's certain in a mm. way. Uh, and that means that, you know, funding might be at risk. And when funding is at risk for universities, the humanities are the first to take the cut. Uh, and archaeology is one of these disciplines within the humanities that has nowhere near as many students as history, uh, as English literature, perhaps as art history. Mm. Uh, and you see archaeology and classics departments uh, getting you know, getting cuts first, usually. Mm. There's they're sort of canaries in the coal mine. Mm. Uh, and, and so just in the very near future, in the next couple of years or so, I see that as a really big threat. Also, you know, if people are sort of scared away from this uncertainty, from coming to places like Glasgow Uni, like Durham, like York, to study, you know, you don't get this outside perspective, which, of course, I'm biased, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think uh, uh, people, from, uh, people from other areas have that outside perspective which is important in a field like medieval uh, history and medieval archaeology where the you know uh, where the sources are so limited to begin with you mm. need a fresh pair of eyes always mm, on this stuff. that's why you always want to ask people outside of academia to say what do you think about this new find you know yeah, because yeah. there's no real right or wrong answer mm. but mo most of the time no definitely yeah. that's, that's a very interesting point actually in terms of um uh, perspectives, because, for example, I, 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 you know, I've been to to St Andrews, and and you know, it was it was. I think they have a fascinating setup there, and so it is, it's not really a formal archaeology department, really, but it, it's a it's a it's a it's a network of people who are working together, and that leads to an approach and an attitude, which is, it, I mean, basically, I suppose uh, it's variation. We need variation, and um, as you say, if, if variation is choked off, then actually everything becomes a little less interesting and crucially less adaptive. I mean, one thing which I, um, not to rabbit on, but one thing which I really appreciate uh, looking back on my um, my time at Durham, actually, it, you're not aware of it when you're there, but certainly since then I've been aware of actually that there was, there was a very particular culture in terms of the archaeology department there. Which is different from some of the people, you know, some you know, contemporaries that maybe I've known, maybe at the Cambridge department or, or in Edinburgh or, or, you know, or in Glasgow, and it, they all have their place in terms of comparative criticism, growth to, uh, as a unit. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. I can I can see why that's 
that's something which which we should keep an eye on definitely in terms of funding yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. you just want you, you just want to be able to attract uh, a wide variety of people and the best people really yeah. uh, and you want to be able to give them the resources that they need to do the kind of work that we do which is increasingly scientific now as mm -hmm. it were you know so archaeology has always been scientific but these days when we're looking to do things uh, like stable isotope analysis mm -hmm. of human mm -hmm. bones DNA analysis mm -hmm. of human bones and those kinds of things that we're uh, laser scanning of your trench of your artifacts the kind mm -hmm. of things that people are coming to expect more and more mm -hmm. uh, it takes it takes, it takes resources, you know, and you want to be able to do that when you have a community dig, when you're sort of presenting this to your community uh, volunteers and, and the people who are going to get the educational resources, you want to be able to provide them the best that you can, you know, mm. so. Mm. Yeah, and I suppose in that sense, uh, there's probably, there's a place there for continuing to fight the notion that archaeology is a hobby. I think. Yeah, yeah, you know, perennial. Uh, yeah. yeah, and so as you say, in that sense, archaeology is one of the first things to get the cut, but it's also a technology and science intensive endeavor. And so, yeah, okay, okay. Well, uh, as finally, then, um, not, not, you know, that sounds like a slight. It's not really a downer. It's just something to be aware of. <laughs> uh, what, what advice would you give to people who want to become archaeologists? Then, oh man, uh, check yourself, man. <laughs> like, make sure <laughs> strap make in. Sure, yeah, that's right. <laughs> No, make you make make sure you sort of gone over your life choices at this point and said, <laughs> <laughs> "What is uh, what is what has gone wrong in my life?" Uh -huh. <laughs> I want to do this to myself. Yeah. No, no, of course I'm just kidding. But, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, do do sort of ask yourself though. This is something that you know. This is something that I wish I would have been aware of when I was starting out uh, in archaeology. When I was switching from medieval history to archaeology, sort of ask yourself, what is it about? Archaeology that is attracting you that that you think you, you can't get from another discipline mm. uh, a, a, And the reason why is those things that interest you are the kinds of questions that you're going to want to find a way of chasing mm -hmm. within archaeology mm -hmm. people get into archaeology thinking that they're going to Dig lots of holes, I guess mm. Mm. Uh, Or you know work in a museum Mm. You know, without realizing that there's a thousand different ways of being an archaeologist especially now, yeah, yeah. you know, there's lab technicians that are archaeologists there's you know there's desk based library based researchers that are archaeologists who mm -hmm. never go out and dig mm -hmm. and there's everything in between material culture people landscape people there's even now space archaeologists yeah, yeah. You know? oh, indeed, but, indeed. I mean, there's 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 a million different ways of being an archaeologist and 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 you know so the question you got to ask yourself is what is it that interests you about the ancient past or the unspoken past uh, that isn't in history books and chase that and find out what's the best way of doing that one specific thing that really gets you out of bed, mm. you know, mm. and find that out. You know, you don't have to fit into one of these sort of uh, the holes, uh, the, the little cubby holes that popular culture puts archaeologists in, you know, yeah. always with a trowel in hand. You know, there's lots of different ways of being an archaeologist. Find out which one's the best for you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. A little catalogue. Um, well, I got to the man with a, with a raincoat. So it's like, here's yeah. the option, yeah. Um, uh, but, uh, I was thinking more like a, like, like a tea trolley with skulls. Oh, yeah. And oh, oh, okay. <laughs> so, that, that's much more civilised. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. Yeah, which, which flavour suits you? And, that, and I think, actually, it's interesting because um, what you mentioned there was, the, was this idea of uh, people think they're going to dig holes or they think they're going to work in a museum. But what what I think you're quite right in so much as I think people often they what they identify really is a process. They're, they're identifying processes that they're going to be undertaking as opposed to actually the end mean the end goal of those processes. So, so as you say, in particular, in your case, it was burials in Scotland from the early Christian world, which does require digging some holes. But the point is the focus, the reason why you're doing it is the end goal it's not so much the process and so yeah yeah maybe a bit more thought beyond simply i will dig holes is is yeah, definitely yeah. a good start definitely yeah um so where did you <laughs> in that sense then what uh given given what we've just been talking about in terms of you know the political climate in the next few years what's 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 coming up for you then i mean what what what, what have you got next in terms of your uh, your research well, I mean, I, I hope uh, I hope the the Glasgow Iona Research Group, as I mentioned, uh, we've we've got a lot of ideas at this point, uh, and it's just about sort of putting in grant applications and seeing how many of these uh, uh, go forward, really. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think that's gonna that's gonna keep on uh, growing. Uh, hopefully, uh, stay tuned, and you'll hear more news about that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in the meantime. 
uh, in the meantime, I've got uh, I've got a lot of uh, 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 I've got a lot of writing, which is which is mostly online so far. But I'm trying to sort of transfer it into you know peer-reviewed academic articles about archaeology and popular culture. You know, archaeology mm -hmm. in movies, in video games, and these kinds of things, and the way that it shows up now, the way that these things are now becoming archaeology. As well, oh, and that's you know, why you're interested in the uh, yeah, yeah the Atlantis poster. Well, I, right. I, I'm fascinated in it's sort of old video games that now yeah. end up in museums. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's uh, it, it's a it's something that you see more and more all the time. There's a museum here in Glasgow, the Riverside Museum, which is a transport museum, but they've also got 70s and 80s toys. Okay, and so there's a whole display on transformers and star wars toys wow. and that's in a museum and it's just like this is amazing so mm. i'm interested in how things that i grew up with are now archaeology you know mm -hmm. they're now in museums behind glass mm. and so what is it about my life that's going to be interesting 50 <laughs> years from now like should i be should i be writing things down yeah. about you know what i'm watching on television yeah. you know yeah. I don't know. Uh, th those kinds of things are really interesting as well. So I have a sort of pop culture and archaeology sideline at this point that I'm trying to make more legit. Yeah, well, and it's funny actually you should, you should say that because it is precisely that that is the stuff which which we don't know, say, about the Roman world. You know, it's the stuff between the um, between the the paragraphs. I mean, my my wife. Um, uh, this is actually the second video in a row that I've mentioned this, but 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 my wife uh, was originally a classicist, um, and she was. Um, particularly interested in philology, the reconstruction of ancient languages, as for those at home who may not know. Um, but, uh, and it, she she frequently complains still, actually, even though now she's a social worker, she complains still about the fact that Roman uh, writers, especially Roman nobles, never really thought to write down how you did something or, or, or what the relationship between, as you say, things like toys or just everyday... Um, I suppose etiquette or it's stuff like that which we just take for granted that you know, it's the pop culture which gets lost and I suppose in that sense yeah. actually, it's fascinating that now it is going into museums um, definitely yeah, yeah that's an interesting point and um yeah, I, I, I have to say my my um, my. Yeah, and and that, that that and that brings us that actually brings us all the way back to the pigs. You see, because the pigs, whatever they did, write down or didn't, it doesn't really survive for no. whatever historical reasons. You mm. know, those monasteries were burned by Vikings or mm. during the sort of wars of independence. So, you know, there's all these sort of theories that have been thrown around, but we just don't have these histories of the pics. We don't have their own side of the story. Uh, and it's because we don't have those that we rely on what we do have, which yeah. is these late Roman sources, which depict them as these horrible barbarians, anti-civilization, you know, mm. naked and tattooed everywhere. Mm. And so that's our sort of image of the pics in pop culture still today, mm. which, you know, surely was true for a moment there while the Romans were fighting them, you know. Well, potentially, but what happened when the Romans went home? Potentially, yeah, but uh, it, it it just sort of reminds me of um I had a very I had a friend from Edinburgh who was incredibly posh, um but he but someone once sort of um said to him something about oh oh you're a pig are you, uh you know gonna get naked or something and he goes I think you'll find anyone who's been uh, north of Edinburgh for t for too long, uh, you know you, you you never see their skin <laughs> like you know they're always covered in in knitted wear and so the idea of actually being naked in the first place is is a questionable one it's so cold and wet and horrible um but actually also one of my favorite things as well is that uh is that at places like vindolanda on hadrian's wall what we see is that very quickly actually the romans adapt to the weather by for example starting to wear trousers so so it's interesting that in that sense i suppose the archaeology just question some of that stuff in terms of them just being naked but uh but as you say yeah that if it's not if it's not fully explored then it becomes this this question mark which is charismatic undeniably though i suppose yeah no yeah. absolutely yeah. i mean that's what attracts people to the field you know mm. it certainly gives them a bit of a mystery which keeps them keeps them cool keeps them interesting so yeah. you know it, it's not to sort of deny that or play that down it's just to say there's that and then there's also all the rest of this other stuff that we need to find out more about yeah yeah definitely definitely okay well um well thank you so much for your time this afternoon adrian it's been a pleasure no great thanks for having me hey you're more than welcome more than welcome and uh, if if uh, if we can can we check back in with you you know as this iona group does develop over time that'd cool. be great yeah i'd really appreciate that excellent excellent grand well Again, thank you very much. Thank you. Not at all. Cheers.